Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham. This is Biochemistry One, and this lecture is the first of two lectures on fatty acid breakdown. And we're going to we're going to break it, this subject really into two different parts. We're going to focus today on how fatty acids get moved uh, around the body. That is. Uh, it, out from your food and dispersed to your tissues, for example, or in some cases made in some tissues and transported to other tissues for use. And then in the second lecture, the next topic after this one, fatty acid breakdown two, we'll come back and look at the intracellular level at how fatty acids are actually broken down and used as energy, used as catabolic metabolites. So let's first remind you of the fact that triglycerides are the by far the major human metabolic fat, the fat that we use for catabol catabolic generation of energy. A typical triglyceride or triacylglycerol molecule a structure is diagrammed here. We've seen them before in earlier segments. Notice that it has a backbone of three carbon backbone of glycerol. That is, uh, uh, each of the three carbons in glycerol has a hydroxyl group on it. And that hydroxyl group is in turn locked in a uh, ester linkage with the three fatty acids involved here. And in fact, let me zero in and point out to you the ester linkages, the three of them that make up this tri glyceride or triacylglycerol molecule. So now stand back before we move on and look at it. Make sure you understand it. So there is a, um, uh, this particular one is has one uh, palmitic acid on it, the one uh, palmitoyl residue, and then two oleic acid residues, the dioleyl uh, uh, at the bottom, in the, the bottom two. Or notice that palmitic acid is saturated, for example, and that uh, oleic acid has one unsaturated or double bond in the middle that you can see diagrammed here. Uh, in fact, uh, triacylglycerides uh, uh, can, in fact, be quite heterogeneous and are even influenced by diet because as you take in, you eat different kinds of fats with different fatty acids, your body stores those fatty acids in fat. And if you're eating a lot of animal fat, for example, you'll tend to have more saturated fatty acids. Eating a lot of, a lot of your lipid is plant-derived, there'll be more unsaturated fatty acids and so on. In fact, that's one of the reasons that the taste of meat that we eat is influenced by the diet of the animal that ate that meat. So when you buy corn-fed beef as opposed to grass-fed beef, for example, it tastes different. And almost all that difference in taste is uh, attributable, in fact, to the different fatty acids in the triacylglycerols, uh, triacylglycerides in the molecule. Okay. So this is the big picture with regard to what we're going to cover in the next two lectures. But let's, I think it's helpful to start right at the beginning and look at the, um, the flow uh, of things through the metabolic pathways that will concern us. So at the very top, you'll notice uh, triacylglycerols or triglycerides. Uh, and fatty acids are released from those. Notice the fatty acids here. Then fatty acids are going to go through a unique a meta catabolic set of reactions that other molecules do not undergo called beta oxidation. <coughs> and no details are shown here. We'll come to those details in the next topic after this one. But notice already at this early step, we're generating both reduced FAD and reduced NAD. In other words, we're pumping reducing potential, what? Into the electron transport system in order to carry out oxidative phosphorylation to pump protons in order to, uh, in turn, drive the synthesis of ATP. But notice also at the bottom left in the red box here, at the end of beta oxidation, two carbons are cleaved off of a fatty acid to generate acetyl-CoA. And then you start the process again and take another two off and another two off, as we'll see next uh, in our next topic. Don't worry too much about the details here. But that acetyl-CoA, just like the acetyl-CoA from glucose-derived pyruvate, is going to plunge into the citric acid cycle, uh, with which we're intimately familiar now, and generate more NAD and FAD, and even one substrate level. Um, uh, uh, phosphorylation event generating a GTP, you'll recall. So we end up getting a lot of energy out of the uh, uh uh, of a fatty acid, as you'll see when we take in the larger picture. But today, again, our focus is how fatty acids get moved around the body, from either from cell to cell or from our food into our circulatory system and there and thence, uh, hence to tissues. Okay. In addition to fatty acids, a, another really important lipid is cholesterol. This lipid plays a really large role in membrane structure. So membranes uh, are made up uh, substantially of, of um, phospho uh, 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 glycerides, that is, a glycerol with a phosphate or a charge group on one of its three hydroxyls, and then fatty acids on the other two, or other molecules that resemble that. 
configuration with a hydrophilic head group and the long side chains, as we've talked about extensively earlier. But then the other major lipid com uh, membrane component is, in fact, cholesterol. So cholesterol gets moved around a lot and tends to get moved around, in fact, with, with uh, uh, fatty acid-based lipids, as you'll see over the next few minutes. Okay, so let's begin with the issue of, of getting f uh, uh, lipids out of our diet and into our tissues and circulatory systems. And it turns out that there's a sort of unique class of molecules that plays a, 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 a crucial and a, a role that's eccentric to the, uh, to the digestion of fats. So if you stop and think for a minute of all the non-fat molecules, so nucleic acids, uh, proteins, uh, carbohydrates, those molecules tend to be relatively hydrophilic. And so when we chew them up and our, they're digested in our uh, GI tract, uh, the, the uh, enzymes that degrade them just come in and chip away at the particles of food. On the other hand, lipids are, particularly triacylglycerides and cholesterol, are very hydrophobic. And they would sit in a big lump uh, uh, with a really poor surface area to volume ratio for digestion uh, if we left them unscathed. So in fact, the body doesn't do that. The body does some, a really, it plays a really neat trick that makes these uh, lipids, breaks these lipids up into tiny uh, emulsified particles, which then digestive enzymes can chip away in. So let's take a minute and look at this. So this uh, uh, symbolizes the fact that lipids get into our bloodstream either from endogenous production, the liver is mentioned here, or, or uh, uh, fat cells can release uh, fatty acids into the circulatory system and so on. But they also get there from our the food that we eat. And um, the, they, the question now in the next couple of minutes is how they get from our GI tract, the food that we swallow, into our circulatory system. So there's a series of steps involved. And the first steps are getting them broken down into the small enough molecules that they can pass the intestinal barrier and, and get into the circulatory system in ways, again, that we'll talk about pr in progressively more detail over the next few minutes. So this image in, in orange here is the GI tract. And we'll, come, we'll refer back to this image several times in emphasizing the, the, the tricks that the GI tract plays. We'll be concerned with its surface, its inner surface, the surface that interacts with the food that you eat. We'll be concerned with its muscular contractions. But our concern right now is how we get two things the digestive enzymes and something called bile salts into the GI tract. So that in fact, there are two organs that are relevant here, and they're symbolized or diagrammed here in this cartoon in two different ways. One is the pancreas. The pancreas, uh, as you recall, has to do with insulin metabolism and something we'll talk about in much more detail later. But it's also a primary source of digestive enzymes. So you remember pancreatic ribonuclease that we looked at uh, in great detail near the beginning of the course, a, a, an early a small protein whose structure and folding patterns we uh, understood early and well. Uh, and the uh, and that the digestive enzymes that the pancreas is going to dump into the upper GI tract, right as the GI tract emerges from your stomach, uh, in in fact include um, um, lipases of various sorts that are going to degrade lipids. But because of the special problem of the hydrophobicity of lipids that we talked about a moment ago, there's a second s organ called the gallbladder, collaborating with the liver in a way that we'll show in just a moment, that synthesizes a kind of detergent that's going to take big droplets of lipid that are inefficiently digested and dissolve them into tiny particles that can be efficiently digested, bile salts. So bile salts are actually manufactured in the liver, and there's a duct, bile duct that it's called, that will allow those bile salts to travel down in, in, a, in an emulsion, or in solution, travel down uh, through the um, duct and into the upper GI tract, very near where the pancreas dumps the digestive enzymes at the beginning of the digestive process as the GI tract emerges again from the stomach. But there's also something off the left here you'll notice called a gallbladder. We call, I called your attention to it a moment ago in the macroscopic sense. The gallbladder stores leftover bile solution if there's excess, so that if you have a high-fat meal, for example, you can uh, secrete uh, bile salts in large amounts in response to the lipid composition of the meal that you just ate. Here in the red box is that um, uh, statement made, and notice now that bile salts are going to travel both directly from the liver down the bile duct, or they can be diverted into the gallbladder and held there for uh, in case they're needed later, or when for when they're needed later. Okay. So bile salts, now the question is, what's so special about them? How are they, why are they detergent-like? They're actually... Uh,